So, okay, so we're ready, ready to start. Hi, my name is Marcin. Um, so, I was born in Poland, now in the US. I started a, 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 a project called Open Source Ecology, and we came up with a very big, hairy, audacious goal. We've identified the 50 different industrial machines that it takes for modern life to exist. Everything from a tractor, to an oven, to a circuit maker. Then we create an open source, we set out to do this, an open source DIY version that anyone can build and maintain at a fraction of the cost. We call that the Global Village Construction Set. So is this reinventing the wheel here? Well, let me tell you a story. So, born in Poland, when I left in 1982, that was the scene that, that was on the streets of Poznań, my hometown. That's not a parade, that's the real scene that behind the Iron Curtain. A time of real material scarcity. So, back in my history, my parents, I mean, my parents were in the Second World War, my grandfather was in a Polish underground, my, my grandmother was in a concentration camp. So those thoughts about scarcity, and especially material scarcity or artificial scarcity, they filled my mind, especially when I moved to America. Things got way better. I remember the first time that I went into a grocery store in America and it was like a Disneyland fairy, fairy tale with all these different colors where back in Poland I would have to wait in line for food like meat and, and butter. So things were great. Kind of, life was kind of easy. I ended up going to Princeton. Then I got a PhD in fusion energy at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I discovered that I was useless. So I felt I had no practical skills, uh, kind of like a co typical consumer lifestyle. So I started a farm in Missouri and learned about the economics of farming. So I bought a tractor, that's the story, then it broke. <laughs> I paid to get it repaired, then it broke again, and pretty soon I was broke too. So I realized that the truly effective, low-cost tools that I needed to start a sustainable farm and village just didn't exist yet. I needed tools that were robust, modular, highly efficient and optimized, low-cost, made from local, easily sourceable materials, and designed for a lifetime of maintainability, not for obsolescence. So then, um, we had to do just that. So I built these tools, I tested them, and I found that industrial productivity can be achieved on a small scale. So then we published all the 3D designs, schematics, instructional videos, and budgets on the wiki. So pretty soon, people from all over the world began showing up, prototyping new machines, during dedicated project visits, or extreme build workshops, or remote design sprints. We did all these different things of developing using a crowd-based crowd process. So right now we're at 21 different machines as of 2016. There's over 100, 110 machines built in total, 29 replications in 10 countries around the world. That's okay, but I mean it's far, far from viral, I mean it's not it's not getting that, that kind of a great spread. There's decent, decent growth in the project. In 2011, I got on a TED stage to do the TED Talk, which has got a, over a million hits right now. So we kept growing it. We can say we're about 25% done at this point, as far as the level of completion. And the most recent project is a, a collaboration where we're starting to build buildings using the same kind of, uh, so we call it the Open Building Institute. My wife and partner on the project are doing that. It's about making affordable, ecological housing widely accessible to anyone. And it's also using open source, using modular design. Uh, so this is a concept design of all the kind of features from solar panels to water catchment to even a biodigester, hydronic heating, a lot of different super efficient eco features. That's the actual build that just happened about three weeks ago. 
We built that house back there, which is 140 square meters in five days using 60 people. So that's an example of the, the rapid parallel build model. We build a number of modules in parallel in the workshop and then assemble them rapidly into place. We call that extreme manufacturing. And the next step here is to start producing materials, like we, we, uh, we produce our own, own bricks, like the compressed earth block. We put in a stabilized compressed earth block floor in one of the, the rooms in there. We're talking about producing our own, because, uh, you know, rocks, sunlight, plants, soil, water, that's all the econ modern economy is made of. How much of that can we tap using modern appropriate technology? So we're looking at even doing things like our own concrete, where you have limestone, you burn limestone, you get burned lime, which is a cement, so things like that. So lumber, 3D printing gets you twin wall polycarbonate glazing, like you saw in the greenhouse in the front. You've got wood, you've got the block, you've got biofiber insulation, paint, um, and other materials just using abundant non-scarce resources. So the idea is to, just like open source software has shown and taken over the backbone of the internet, we're trying to do the same for hardware, basically create an open source platform or open source framework where open collaborative development is the norm as opposed to the, the proprietary development where people are pretty much reinventing the wheel all the time. So let's go through some of the main milestones that we've achieved to date which is seven. So the first one is that replications have happened. People simply downloaded our blueprints. And this guy here, this is in 2011, pretty soon after the TED talk, this guy sends me this picture. And I was like, wow, that looks like a photocopy, <laughs> Photoshop copy of my machine. But no, that's a real thing. That's, he built it. He just didn't even tell me. He downloaded the plans and built the machine and impressed some bricks to build houses with. So another replication in America, it's a power cube. Um, a tractor by a group of high school students, a tractor built in Guatemala, um, a brick press in Italy, one in China, this is in Turkey in an art show, one in Texas, another guy in Texas who's building the house. This is Nicaragua, which appears to be two of our brick presses and four power cubes in a block production facility where people are, are building houses like that. Someone just sent, sent me that rapidly. So there may be like way more than we know as far as the replications happening, but we know of, uh, we've documented 113 altogether, um, well, 20, 29 replications in different places that we know of. There may be many more. This is a recent one from Peru at a gold mine with some native peoples. So they're using a tractor to move dirt around and pump water. Um, so the second main milestone is the extreme manufacturing, the, the efficient production. So we get our machines down to a single day of build. In 2012, we've achieved a one-day build of our brick press. So after streamlining all the workflow procedures using some digital fabrication, like CNC cutting of all the metal, and language agnostic instructionals that you can follow very easily without making mistakes, using some principles like polka yoke, which means parts only fit in a certain way. Using a lot of different tricks allows you to take a team of unskilled people and walk them through. So I can now take, take a team of people, we train them in a deep immersion kind of a program. We throw you into the deep end of the, the pond and you learn some skills and a team, an inexperienced team is able to build a machine like that. A one ton machine, like you see in the back. It's a machine that can produce 5,000 bricks in a day. It's automated using a little Arduino microcontroller. Uh, 5,000 bricks is enough for a small house. It costs like four to five thousand dollars in materials. But the nearest competitor of the same throughput machine would co would cost you about fifty-two thousand dollars. So there's significant economics that we're seeing as a benefit of the open source method. We're we're taking the R&D costs down. People contribute their effort, and therefore we don't have to charge somebody for all the R&D time. So the third milestone of what we do is radical modularity. You see uh, all this box beam tubing. Um, in the tractor, for example, you see the modular kind of like Lego-like um, tubing. 
and parts like the wheels, they can interchange, the power cube interchanges. So we take any machine, we break it down into modules, and then we develop a whole set of about 40 steps for each module. So say you got the frame of the tractor, the wheel units, the loader, each of them goes through like a 40, 40 step procedure for developing like all the critical things like from your requirements to conceptual design to technical design to your bill of materials and instructionals. We do that. Things like the power cube, it's a, that's a universal hydraulic power source that can run the tractor, it can run other machines, so it's a modular engine unit that can run any of the machines. It can be fueled by charcoal, by gasoline, or by solar. Uh, so you see the same kind of tubing for frames for, for things like a CNC torch table. We built an iron worker machine which cuts metal uh, out of the same kind of tubing like you see here. These are the universal rotors where, in one case, you can have a big trencher on that rotor. If you look at the, the rotor on the trencher there, the exact same, tr same universal rotor unit is on the wheels, so you see how the parts are interchanged throughout. They serve different functions, also like a, you can turn that into a rototiller, into heavy-duty string trimmer, or a honey extractor even. And the same kind of modularity we're applying to the structures. We build um, all the different modules, like the door, window, roof modules, also, to, and that's, that's the greenhouse under construction, that's from 2015, which is, this is how it looks from the outside, this is about May of this year, that's how it looked inside in February, so this is in a brut brutally cold winter, we have a ton of bok choy in there, ready for that kimchi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that was the greenhouse about May or June, and you see there we planted about 10,000 hazelnuts, so we're actually getting into breeding of plants. That's another area that we're doing, like uh, per perennial crops are a good idea because, I don't know if you know the figures for Europe, but in America, each acre of tilled soil wastes, there's four tons of soil per acre that are blown just by erosion on average in America. That's like insane. So that's where you want to go to perennial crops like hazelnuts or chestnuts, so we're working on that as an aside. Um, but aquaponics, we've got the fish in the tanks, the, the towers serve as the filters, and so forth. So it's a complex ecosystem, we're working that out. So a fourth major milestone is about reducing the prototyping cycle from months to days. So by using this modular build technique of interchangeable parts, now you have the, the parts ready so you can build things much more rapidly. Like to give you an example, this uh, green bluish machine, there is an iron worker that can cut one inch thick slabs of steel. Um, but it took us about six months to build that machine with all the cutting there, like the round corners and some machining. So he said, okay, six months, no way will that be economically feasible to produce it. So we stripped it down to the very, very basics and in the upper right, you see a very much stripped down modular machine that still can cut a one by 10 slab of steel without a problem. And it took us 24 hours to build that with two people. So that's an example of the radical time savings. And this backhoe here, we built, designed and built it and tested it over two weeks. So that's, that's pretty good. Uh, we treat everything as a construction set. So we don't talk about just a tractor. We talk about a tractor construction set where you can build a tractor, a bulldozer, a backhoe or anything. Or like now the... 3D printer construction set. So right now, the next time for that, I'm thinking April 15, I'm coming back here and let's run a workshop on that. We were supposed to do it after this event, but we didn't have the design finished. But the cool thing about this 3D printer construction set, you see this, this is that universal access unit that you might have seen in the uh, OLAB. Uh, but basically this universal access is what makes up bigger machines like a CNC router, a small machine like a 3D printer with a different head, it could be a little laser cutter. This could be a CNC torch table for cutting out the metals for all your machines. So our progression right now is start with a 3D printer, build the larger CNC torch table so we can manufacture our machines rapidly by digitally cutting out all the metal 
for the machines rapidly so that we can achieve that one day build, which makes it really economically feasible to do that. Okay, fifth milestone is real-time documentation. So one of the things that's very hard to do when you're uh, building things is to document the stuff while you're doing it because it takes a lot of energy. So we've shown that we can have people listening on a Google Hangout, we take pictures, we upload them in real time, and also upload some videos so that by the time the build was finished, we had an instructional ready because there was a remote team working with us and that pretty much doubled our capacity to document and we didn't lose the things that you typically lose because you build it and you never go back to the documentation. That's a typical thing that happens. So we can do that and we'd like to make that a regular practice in our work. So the sixth milestone we've achieved is the ext extreme manufacturing model, uh, the business model for doing that in workshops. So the way it works is that we produce the machine, we charge people for an educational experience, and then we can also sell the machine. So, uh, so the way we fund ourselves is 80% right now, we, we fund ourselves through the workshops. So extreme manufacturing workshops. Yeah, we did some crowdfunding. We recently did the Open Building Institute. We had, we had some um, crowdfunding through True Fans where people donate like 10 bucks a month. But uh, we're doing it now more through the extreme manufacturing workshops. So for example, a one day build of the 3D printer, we had 12 people show up paying $300 over the, the bill of materials cost, so we, we could make that $3,600. Now, it took us like two months to prepare that, so that doesn't make sense, but if you streamline that to, we'd like to streamline it to, to about three days of preparation, so in about four, four days total time, we can pull off one of those events, and that could be a viable economic model for production. Um, we build the CEB press. Uh, typically, we run a three-day workshop on that, we sell the machine for $5,000 over the bill of materials cost, about $10,000, and we charge people for admission so we can actually pull in like $10,000 from one of those events. And this Seed Eco Home, the Aquapana Greenhouse, the picture that you saw we just built recently, uh, there were 60 people that showed up for each workshop. So in 10 days, we got $50,000 just in the tuition, which pretty much is able to pay for this this uh, development, pay for all the materials and other costs. So that's really good. So we think this community-based manufacturing model where you can produce just about anything, could be your car, could be a house, could be anything, um, we'd like to show people how to do that wherever they are, any community, um, anywhere around the world using the open source microfactory. You have all the downloadable digital design uh, that people collaborate on worldwide, and then you can build that stuff locally in a workshop context. So this is the, the extreme day build. We can say that's the seventh, sorry, that should be seven. Um, we do that in five days now. So the big 140 square meter house, uh, two story, with uh, like the floor was finished, it's got solar panels on a roof, it's off grid on water power, it's got a biodigester, hydronic heating, thermoelectric generator, make, we make our own stove and build other things in there. Um, took five days and the greenhouse was another workshop that also took us another five days to build that. But that's the kind of uh, model we're trying to develop and people are asking us for these houses, people want this build, there's huge demand for, I mean the material cost on a house is $30,000 for the house. So we're able to, to build it at the cost of materials we get paid for the tuition, so there's a very interesting kind of like reversing the labor model concept here where we're able to gain multiple revenue streams using the, the extreme production model. Um, so distributive enterprise is what we talk about. So it's open, uh, so I wrote about this <clears throat> an MIT Innovations Journal towards an open source civilization. You can read about distributive enterprise. That concept is the idea that the essential part of a business that you develop is the fact that you give it away to others. You train others. And that's what we mean by distributive enterprise. So you can think about the great multiplier effect of how a business that's developed collaboratively, if replicated by a lot of people around the world, can have huge economic impact. And that's what we're after. That would be the promise of open source which has not yet been delivered. The promise of open source has been delivered in software, but hardware right now is pretty much in the dark ages of that, unfortunately. 
but I, we're very optimistic about what could happen with our recent results and uh, the extreme manufacturing workshops that we're doing um, because this is the equation that we're trying to solve and that is the 85 of the world's richest people have as much wealth as the 3.5 billion at the bottom of the pyramid. So that's, that's a fact. While um, you know, that's happening, the genuine progress indicator is not rising. The quality of life is not, um, not better for everyone. So the people, you know, like you got your Silicon Valley and those kinds of people are very optimistic, but we have to look at the, the, this equation here in this last slide. I mean, does that really show that things are not better for everybody? I mean, is the world really getting better? I mean, what's the real answer to that? We should really ask ourselves what that really means as far as wealth for everybody. But right now, the open source economy is under 100 million total across the world. There's a few successful open source hardware companies but for all practical purposes, it's about one millionth of the entire economy. It's like one-tenth of one percent. Oh, sorry, like one-ten-thousandth of one percent, something like that. For all practical purposes, it doesn't exist. The business as usual is, um, is that people are proprietary. People believe that patents are the only way to, uh, you know, the proponents of patents talk about patents protecting innovation, but I think that's far from the truth because... Uh, if you're locking up an intellectual property, you're not letting everyone benefit from the, the fruit of all the previous generations. That, you know, you lock it up in a patent, you're kind of stopping that progress at that point. But open source historically has been shown to work. Like, um, this is actually the case of uh, uh, the story of the steam engine from the first industrial revolution it actually showed how open source can work and what this graph shows is the efficiency of steam engines on the y-axis and the x-axis is time. But the, the first part of the graph there, the low part there, is when Watt's patent was active and what happened when that patent expired. In about eight, seven, 1800s, expiration of Watt's patent. Uh, after that, uh, people started to publish and innovate and when you look at this whole story, if you analyze this story, it shows that the rate of innovation has doubled once the patent expired. People published a journal. They did not have wikis at that time, so they published on paper. But that showed that uh, innovation went up in that case. And we believe the same is happening today. It can happen today. But companies like Apple and Google spend more on patents than, on, than research and innovation in 2012. Can you believe that? So think about what would happen if that, all that energy went to true innovation to solve real problems. What would the world look like? So we talk about solving the grand challenges of the world. Our humble 2034, this is our 25-year roadmap. The humble goal for 2034 is end of all resource conflicts. Material security and material scarcity, artificial scarcity, still drives the politics and economics of the world. That's why we believe in distributive enterprise, open source. The open source economy is the next step in human evolution. And that's, that's, that's essentially what we're working on. It's a, it's a serious issue. And we invite you to join. So it's a powerful idea. So as far as, yeah, here's the, some of the contact information. I think I'll wrap up pretty much here. But the idea is right now our next step is to demonstrate authentically what the distributive enterprise could work like with the 3D printer as a case in point. So as I mentioned, we're going to have a workshop here in, in uh, April 15. But basically develop that, uh, the blueprints, the enterprise model, document how you would run a workshop, uh, prepare that so that anyone can run this around the world and people can borrow that where we all collaborate on getting the best design in the world and then have it spread in a really, really rapid fashion uh, so that the true power of that, of that economic model of open source is really shown to, uh, very clear to people. So that's where we're at right now. Um, so if you want to join that, we're, looking, we're building a team to focus on that for now. And then we move on to the heavier duty uh, fabrication machines so we can build all the other machines. But that's where we are right now. So um, I think I'll wrap up there. And uh, thank you for your attention. And 
save the world. <laughs>